once the printing press gets going late 2024 or sometime in 2025, I'm calling for gold to have a huge run the second half of this decade and maybe peak out around 20,000. <laughs> that's, that's crazy talk. But that's my if, face at 20,000. David Hunter, Chief Macro Strategist of Contrarian Macro Advisors. It is so great to welcome you on the show. Thank you so much for joining me, David. Yeah. Hi, Julia. It's great to be on. Thank you. Well, great to have you because I had a lot of folks request you and I do love to listen to my viewers and uh, get folks on that they are eager to hear from. So thank you again for coming on. And I was just reading about you and you're contrarian and you've been in this business for 50 years. I want to go back and get some background on you. And also, David, um, when did you become a contrarian? Pretty early on in my career, I started in the business in 1973. So I came in during the 73, 74 uh, top and then big bear market that at that time was the biggest bear market we had had in the post-World War II era. So it kind of taught me early on the value of, of um, risk, you know, being aware of your risks and, and risk management. And fairly early on, I noticed that um, yeah, a lot of the market was emotion driven, uh, psychologically driven, and and oh, you know, it, it's developed over the years in terms of my convictions. But clearly, cycle to cycle to cycle, I've seen that at at bottoms most people are bearish, and at tops most people are bullish. And what you try to do is reverse that. Uh, so I tend to be at the extreme ends of the cycle, uh, pretty alone. I mean, uh, you know, as an example, last last October, I was quite bullish and saying, I think we're very close to a big reversal. And people thought I was crazy. I mean, you know, they, they were just sure we were going to 3000. So so it, it just um, as you do this for as many years as I have, um, it it becomes kind of second nature. It's, it's easy. And I've also over the years learned that it's. Um, probably for the vast majority of people much easier to be with the crowd they don't like to be outside the crowd it's just kind of um, human nature so uh, for me it was a natural thing i just uh, whether you're born with it or what i'm i'm, I'm actually um, happiest when nobody agrees with me so <laughs> i love that and you're so you're okay being that um the bit of the the lone lone voice and you, you you lean into that and you 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 like that aspect of it um okay so i want to talk about markets now you mentioned back in october um your call then um what what do you think of i guess let's start with my, maybe more of the big picture view and also we'll get okay big picture view of markets and also the economy let's hit both okay sure um as you know i think up until very recently most people were pretty sure we were going to see lower lows and so um and rightfully so the market has i mean the economy has not been uh good and we've been uh seeing a fed that's tightening and continues to say they're going to tighten further so for the majority of people uh you know for the consensus it's been a view that um, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And so I, you know, I've taken a lot of flack for staying bullish through um, certainly the last eight months uh, and, and probably was a little premature last spring and saying we're very close to a point where we'll turn. I'd look for a correction. I called a, a melt up in, in 2020 and 21 and, and uh, called pretty much a top in at the end of 21. So we're going to go through a 10 or 15% correction. Well, it turned out to be double that. So, you know, I was a little premature and a little didn't, didn't see the damage that was coming. But I, I turned bullish in the spring and said, we, and then in June said, I think we probably are very close to a bottom. And in hindsight, that's pretty much what happened. We bottomed in June, um, retested in October with a, a lower low, uh, which is classic. Um, and we've run. And so um, I've, I've stayed there because I think markets lead and markets look over troughs. Um, that's what's so hard for most investors to understand is they're looking at current information, current news, 
uh, current Fed speak, and they're reacting to that. And I'm telling them that it's already in the market, and that although we'll stair step our way there, I think we're going higher before you know before we top out. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I want to explore that because you're talking about investors; they tend to look at like the current news, Fed speak, if you will. I want to hear more about what do you look at. Yeah, I've I've always and I again this develops over the years, but fairly early on recognize that the stock market is one of your best leading indicators. It's not always right, but in general, it tends to lead the economy by six to nine months. So, um, you know, every cycle I was in, I observed that the market turned well before the economy turned up. Um, the market turned down well before the economy turned down. You saw signs, you had leading indicators, you had lots of things you could look at economically to tell you what was coming, but the actual um, uh, upturn and, and downturn was many months after the market. So that's, you know, that's ingrained in me that the market is a leading indicator uh, and it's usually six to nine months. It can sometimes be a little longer than that. Um, and I think for most people, that's that's not a concept they, they really grasp um, thoroughly. And I would say the Fed doesn't really grasp that. Uh, the Federal Reserve is right now and has been for the last year, been targeting the stock market, thinking that it should be lower, thinking that we need to get the stock market down to have a, a dampening wealth effect to get the economy slowing and knock down inflation. And I've been very critical of that. That was Bill Dud Dudley's thesis that came out last April in a speech. And Jay Powell has embraced that. And I said so that's really a huge mistake. The Fed should not try to target the market up or down. Um, but particularly in, in this cycle down, that what they're doing is, is they have a very poor track record of calling the stock market. You know, Alan Greenspan called irrational exuberance several times or several years before the market topped out. Um, and Janet Yellen didn't have a good track record in doing that. Jay Powell doesn't uh, have the background to call the market. So by targeting the stock market and saying we want it down to 3,000 or we want it much lower, um, they're, they're stepping out of their um, bailiwick, out of their expertise. And and frankly, they're taking away one of their best leading indicators. I think the stock market's a better forecaster of the economy than is um uh, you know, the FOMC than, than a large group of economists, you know. So by by instead of looking at the stock market and saying, what is it telling us? They're deciding that they're going to tell the stock market what it should do. That's a huge mistake. Mm. That's OK. This is fa this is why I love I love this show so much, because I take a lot of notes. I learn from my guests and you're helping me learn. OK. Um, the stock market, a better forecaster of the economy than the FOMC. This is where, okay, so I get a little confused when I look at the market now because um, it's kind of perplexing to me because I've had a lot of folks come on and say they're expecting a recession and I'm just like, why is the, why is the market going up? So I, where, what am I missing or what what is the disconnect or what is the market right now forecasting about the economy? Yeah, so let's, let's step back a, a second and say, um, not that long ago, you know, the last six months, certainly, and before that, um, there's been all this talk about this huge earnings dip that's coming, that earnings are, you know, uh, that the market's way overvalued, that the earnings are going to come down sharply, and that the market was going to come down sharply. And we had that call uh, from some pretty important people on Wall Street, um, one who won't be named, but was kind of uh, in the forefront on that. And um, it didn't, first quarter was supposed to be a terrible quarter for earnings. It didn't happen. You know, you had adjustments downward. They did, played their typical game of announcing uh, earnings, at, uh, you know, lowering earnings expectations. Then when they report, they come out above expectations. So that's the game the companies play. Um, and it happened again. But But the big dip in earnings has not happened. And guess what? The stock market, was up 
it knew that well in advance of that. You know, the stock market, uh, you know, the, the law of large numbers is able to kind of put together all their analysis and come up with an understanding that the earnings in the economy is not about to fall off a cliff like everybody's expecting. So um, I think going forward, looking now, the economy has been surprisingly resilient. Um, so a lot of people are shifting to more of a soft landing view, whereas six months ago, they were so sure we were headed for my term, global bust. I've been calling for a global bust for a while uh, for what happens at the end of the cycle. Um, and people are starting to lower their worries, um, lower their expectations for a bad economy and thinking we may skate through this and have just a either a very modest downturn or not even a downturn. Um, I don't agree with that either, but at least for now, the stock market's pretty much telling you that, that we're not in, we're not on the eve of some kind of a major um, downturn in the economy. I think we will have a downturn in the economy in 2024. So the stock market, if it does what I'm calling for, which is a melt up, is gonna be proven, you know, is gonna have to reverse itself. But for the time being, I think the stock market is um, telling you it's not time to worry. Oh, got it. Okay. Can you explain that? I want to hear a bit more on the melt up um, and going into, you think in 2024, we'll see that downturn. I want to hear more on the thesis on the melt up and how do you, how do you put together this thesis? How do you kind of come to this um, conclusion or this forecast? Yeah, it's, it's hard to explain in total. I always say I, I look at technical, so I look the uh, you know uh, technical now. I use technical analysis. I look at uh, fundamentals. I'm strong in macro. I've been doing macro for 50 years, um, so I use smart macro analysis. Um, and then that behavioral economics, you know, I use um, sentiment. And what we had last year was probably in my in my career, I hadn't seen such a consensus of bearishness. Um, or it was certainly at the extreme end of it, to the point where almost everybody was on one side of the boat. And I just said, you're, you know, before we go down, you're going to see a shift to people moving to the other side of the boat. It just happens, you know. You and and my technical analysis, my fundamental analysis, was also saying things aren't as bad as everybody thinks. So expectations are far more bearish than reality. Um, so you put all that together, and and I do what I call cross market analysis, which I had several markets confirming my beliefs. You know, one was confirming the other. Um, that all raised my conviction, and and as a result, I said we're in an unusual time. Yes, there are some real excesses out there, and there are real problems coming, but they're not coming yet. The expectations, the the, the bearish expectations, are way ahead of themselves. And that what we're going to have before we get to the reality of that bearish expectation is we're going to have a shift where all those people on one side of the boat are going to have to capitulate and move to the other side of the boat. And if they do it in a concentrated period of time, that you can get a melt up. And a melt up, by my definition, means it's not just a nice rally. You know, you start seeing the term thrown around a lot. And people, you get a couple hundred point rally in the S&P and people are talking melt up. Now, melt up to me is something that rarely happens. It's a parabolic move, a vertical move in the market that covers, you know, two and three years worth of returns in a, you know, in a six month time horizon. So um, we had it in. 2000, early 2000, 1999, 2000 with the NASDAQ, uh, the dot-com bubble. Uh, we had it in 1929 with the, with the blow-off top there. But we, you know, we haven't had that many. We probably had one in 1973 with the Nifty 50 run-up. Um, but they're rare, and they usually come at the end of a cycle. Um, and that's what I think we're at. I, I call this the end of a 41-year bull market that started in August of 1982. Um, I date it back to then because that's when disinflation kicked in, when inflation, you know, that hyperinflation you hear about that happened in the early 80s, that's when that peaked out and you had you had uh, the long bond, the 30-year bond, go from a 15% rate in 
rate in 1982 to um, you know below one percent, and the ten-year go from 15 percent to almost zero uh, in 2020. So you've had this big run in rates down, and the price earnings multiple, the market multiple. Um, is the inverse of that. It will move up as rates move down. So you had this long 40 plus year cycle where rates were moving down, PE multiples were moving up. And I think we're in the last stage of that. I, I do think we'll get rates down one more time here. Um, and PE multiples, you probably see the S&P market multiple up to 25. Um, but it's, it's the blow off. It's the end. So melt up, I use melt up and if if people, because I called the melt up in 2020, 2021, when the market doubled, and now I'm calling for another one, and people get confused and think it's all one melt up. I go, no, it's two different ones. We don't see them very often, but we happen to see we're we're going to see two in a very short time, a very rare occurrence. Mm -hmm. And I tell people, if you have trouble with me using that term twice, consider this a blow off. You know, they they mean basically the same thing: melt up or blow off. Yeah. This, okay. Even more to dig into because this is this is so fascinating. So melt ups, very rare occurrences. Um, and you mentioned like the the term rally. There's a lot of a lot of people are calling it a rally, a stock market rally. So when I hear you talk about melt up and it being a rare occurrence, and you talk about it 1929, um, maybe one in 1973 with the Nifty Fifty, um, 2000, um, 2021. These don't necessarily. I'm just thinking out loud here. A melt up's not necessarily a good thing or a positive thing, is it? Can it end badly? Is that what I'm hearing? Or yeah, it's a, it's a high risk rally. It it tends to cover, like I said, it can cover two or three years worth of returns or more in a period of six months. So it's exciting, but the other side of it is equally uh, steep. So you you can run up very fast, but then you can get hit very hard. So particularly if it's a melt up into a major top like this one, if if I'm right and this is a 41 year top, you know that's a, that's a think about that. I mean that's that's almost my whole career, and we're topping out, and then what follows that is a long bear market, mm. uh, secular bear market. So so yeah. I, I tell people I'm forecasting. I'm saying what I think is going to happen in the market. I'm not endorsing. I'm not telling people how to, you know that they should play it. Everybody has to decide for themselves how nimble am I? How much risk do I want to take on? Because it's high return, high risk. Period. And yeah. and that's I think the hardest part. People on Twitter, I get plenty of uh, you know trolls or or critics saying, you know, you're nuts and this is crazy. And I think they they think I'm advising people to buy it. I'm not. I, I don't advise. I just forecast. Um, I was going to say, I, I heard the important term there, and that was cycle. And it sounds to me you look at cycles. Um, and you mentioned um, you're calling for the end of a 41-year bull market, um, end of that cycle. Can we explore that? a bit too. And, and I want to hear more about how you're looking at cycles. Yeah. Cycles, people hear cycle and they think of, um, there are people that use time cycles, you know, they have all kinds of different time frames that they look at in cycles. I'm not talking time cycles. It's strictly, I look at two kinds of cycles, economic cycles and a market cycle that is tied to economic cycles. And then within that, there are cyclical bull markets, like um, you know, 2008-9 to now, uh, or maybe some people say the cycle ended in 2020, but either way, that's a cyclical bull market. We had a cyclical bull market, um, um, you know, 1973 to 1980, uh, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, there's a secular bull market, and that, that encompasses several cyclical bull markets, several economic cycles within so the secular are longer term cycles. And then there's a third cycle that I look at, which is the super cycle. And the super cycle is what I define as a cycle between two depressions. So I believe, you know, 1930s was our last depression, the Great Depression. And I believe we're going to have a depression in the 2030s. So it's basically 100 years, um, you know, 90 to 100 years. And that's, uh, it's not defined by time. It's really defined by 
um, the economy. Um, so those are the kind of cycles and market cycles, as I said, you know, vary depending on whether you're talking about, um, you know, secular cycle, a super cycle, or, um, you know, just an economic, um, a, a, a market tied to an economic cycle. Yeah. So I heard you just say you're expecting um, a depression in 2030s. And I'm also looking at my notes when you said earlier, you think we're at the end of the cycle and that you think we're heading for a global bust. I want to hear about this global bust forecast and also just the thought of a depression. I'm, I'm, you know, it, I've only ever read about the Great Depression. I've talked to people who, um, I guess, more in recent years, they they've pa- have since passed, but who are in their 90s. I've asked them about the Great the Great Depression and that experience, um, and some of those were very like emotional stories. I want to hear how you, you think of depression could play out. What could that look like too? Sure. So how we get there. Um... If, if I'm right, we have a melt up and we have a top in the economic cycle here um, and then go through a global bust in 2024. Um, again, my term for a global bust and people I've used this term for probably the last seven or eight years and others have seen it. You know, it's been out there, but I was really the first to talk about it. not that bust is a unique term, but in relation to what was coming. Um and so now you see a lot of people throwing around the term bust and a lot of times they're talking about the stock market going bust and i go no bust refers to the economy so a global bust by my definition is something that's bigger than a recession um but happens at the speed of recession so unlike a depression that can cover many many years like the great depression covered the 30s 1930s a bust will be very compressed into maybe 12 to 18 months but it'll feel like a depression because it'll be bigger. There'll be a big financial crisis accompanied with it. Um, 2008-9 came very close to being a bust. We kind of took it back from the cliff just in time. You know, the commercial paper market froze froze up and they freed that up pretty quickly. Um, You know, big major companies almost went under. They saved the banks. A bust will be um, that next step where we'll see a dominoing effect of of banks failing around the world. As I say, I don't think the U.S. is where you're going to see most of those. I think it's primarily centered elsewhere because 2008-9, our banks were in trouble and they cleaned up their acts, so they're in, they're much better capitalized today. Europe's banks are more vulnerable. Um, some of the Asian banks are more vulnerable. Um, you know, Canada, Australia, uh, the banks there have more leverage than we do. So that's where I think the risks are greater in this because it is a global bust, but it'll be fairly fast. It'll be steep. It'll be scary. Um, I think accompanying it will be an 80% bear market. So in the stock market. So, you know, if we peak out, at six to seven thousand on the s p as i'm forecasting uh this year um we could drop to you know as much as 80 percent down uh from there um in in less than a year's time uh so it'll be a fast bear market um the economy will have probably double digit unemployment um so it'll be rough and again this all sounds scary except remember 2020 we saw something we had not seen in ever i don't think was shut down the economy um you know unemployment rapidly went up uh because of the pandemic etc so so it's not it's not as crazy as it sounds it's not unrealistic to say that we have excesses that have built up over a long period of time and that uh those excesses including tremendous um leverage in the system can lead to a, a very sharp downturn and, and market decline. The good news in that, and sound like good news, but the good news in that is that um, it will bring about deflation. So the inflation we're worried about now is, is mostly behind us. And I think by next year, we're going to be going into negative inflation or deflation. That means the central banks will have the freedom and the ability to print all the money they need to print. And you will see money uh, printed at levels we've never seen before. 
because they will be dealing with a financial crisis, the likes of which we have not, you have not seen in your lifetime, I have not seen in my lifetime. And as a result, they won't have a choice. They will have to just pump money into the system at, at rates we've not seen. We saw incredible rates of, of money printing back in 2020. You know, we had five trillion in in uh, the bank. Uh, the Fed's balance sheet expanded by five trillion. I'm guessing this time it will take twenty trillion. So something, you know, the Fed's balance sheet, which is currently just below nine trillion, I think will grow to over thirty. I mean, that's incredible. Because keep in mind, back in two thousand eight, our the Fed's balance sheet was eight hundred seventy five billion. So we are seeing this thing exponentially grow. And it's because you're getting to the end of the super cycle where things, the excess is just explode, you know, get very big. And, and so as a result of that bus, you will see money printing like we've never seen. It will trigger in the 2025 to 2030 period, a industrial driven recovery, not so much consumer this time. We've had a consumer economies for the last 40 years, but the, the next one's going to be industrially driven. We'll have a lot of reshoring, you know, a lot of uh, new plant and equipment in this country, as well as around the world. Um, we'll have a huge commodity cycle because that reshoring and all the industrial activity will boost demand for commodities at two levels we haven't seen in a long time. And we don't have the supplies of commodities or the access to uh, instant supply uh, because of years of kind of shrinking uh, commodity activity. And so you're going to have this perfect storm of rapid demand for commodities, uh, nowhere near the supply to meet it, and prices go through the roof. So you will have a very fast um, inflation cycle starting probably you know mid-decade. And by the end of the decade, I think we could see 20 to 25% inflation rates in this country and somewhat similar around the world. So it'll be a global inflation cycle, global commodity cycle, global industrial cycle, um, but it'll burn itself out very quickly because you've got this huge debt problem, mm. not just here, but around yeah. the world. And how do we finance debt? We have trouble financing that debt when rates are four or 5%. How do we finance that debt if rates are 15 or 20%, it's it's almost, you know, there's no, no equation I can come up with that will make that work. Um, so that then leads to what I call, uh, what I said before, depression in the 2030s. So that's kind of how we get there. I know it's a lot to absorb, and I know it's, you know, it's, it's up and down and up again and down. Um, so it sounds a little schizophrenic, but it's, it's it's what happens when you get towards the end of a super cycle. Things get the volatility gets uh, much more extreme. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a lot <laughs> to dig into here too. And and I keep in mind I'm I'm not an expert. I get to talk to incredibly smart folks like yourself and ask them questions and try to learn along the way. Okay. I I just have a question um, because um, I heard you talk about deflation and then later um, bringing up. I guess maybe it's an inflation cycle getting back into like I guess extraordinary levels of inflation. I want to hear about okay when we get to the def deflation part of your thesis, um, because it reminds me and, and I don't have it off the top of my head. I had Jim Rickards on several months ago and he mentioned like deflation was a nightmare scenario for central banks. Can you explain like um, deflation and and you know we also have these high levels of debt too. Um, you mentioned the debt problem. How does that impact it? Yeah. So that first, I'll I'll say we have three hundred trillion in global debt. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, I mean three years ago now, I guess um, pre pandemic, we were at two hundred fifty trillion. So we have increased debt fifty trillion in just three years. And that's what I mean by this is moving fast. I mean, I, I don't think people can wrap their you know really wrap their heads around. What's a trillion dollars? And fifty trillion is something we, you know, we we're, we weren't even at a trillion dollars in debt, you know, thirty years ago. So it's like, what's going on? So we have three hundred trillion in debt. 
we've got quadrillions in notional value of derivatives, which again, we have, you know, you go back 25 years and derivatives were just getting started. So we, we've, you know, we've ramped this stuff up and we're in, we're in territory that there's nobody on earth that can really understand what the implications of that are or how, how that, you know, how does that get controlled? So what I learned in business school long ago is that leverage enhances things on the way up. Uh, you know, you can borrow and if things are going well, that borrowing allows you to, you know, experience, for example, in your house, experiencing gains and values of the house. But leverage hurts you on the way down. If you lose your job and you have a, a debt to pay, how do you pay it? So um, same thing with the government. I mean, le leverage is it can expand things on the way up, but it can really contract things on the way down. So with with leverage like we have never had in the history of the world uh, today, that's a, a huge risk that's hanging over this system. And that's why I think we're going to have potentially the biggest financial crisis uh, in history next year. Now, 2008-9 was huge, and we really hadn't seen anything like that in the magnitude of risk and how fast things unwound. Um, so this is really that on, on uh, steroids. You know, it's just the same thing we saw in 2008, except bigger and faster. Uh, the unwind, I think, will be bigger and faster. The only reason, uh, and, and you know, I think somebody like Jim Rickards might be more inclined to say it's all downhill from there. The only reason why I have that one more cycle before we get to the depression is because of the printing press. Mm. Bec and as I say, if if policymakers, both government policymakers and and central bankers. If they have the wherewithal to save a system, they will, right? They're not going to sit there and say, well, I worry if I print too much money, I'm, I'm going to cause inflation down the road. They're going to be sitting there saying, we're seeing banks dominoing across the world failing. We've got to do something. And the only policy tool they have that, that can work fast, that, that they have the ability to move fast with, is the printing press. I mean, they, they can print money quickly, as we saw in 2020. So, and it won't just be the Fed. It will be every central bank, um, you know, People's Bank of China included. You will see money come out of every central bank at rates we've never seen before. And so with a lag, and it, it is a lag of probably six to nine months, that will, that will begin to show an upturn. So let's say it happens in 2024. By mid-2025, we should be coming out of this. So deflation, yes, but that deflation will last very, you know, be a short-term deflationary cycle. I think Jim Rickards, I don't know his call exactly, but I think he's probably talking about a longer deflationary period. And the reason he said banks, the central banks, um, don't like deflation, or whatever the quote was you gave me, is it's it's very hard if you get into a prolonged deflationary cycle, it's very hard to pull pull it out. It's, it kind of has a, a self-feeding mechanism. So they they really don't want to get it. They're, they're scared to death of deflation just as like they are inflation. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I think because of, you know, it's short-term deflation, it will give them, they, and, and if you ask Jay Powell today, he would he would not see this coming. You know, he would say, no, we're not going to print money again like that. We'll never do that again. But if you're faced with the situation I think they're going to be faced with next year, he won't have a choice. Yeah. Um, I want to also bring up with you because in the notes, you you mentioned commodity prices going through the roof. And when I think of commodities, obviously, I think of oil. I think of the precious metals. Can you explain that? And also um, on this show, a lot of the folks who watch they seem keen to hear different theses, the theses on gold. So I'd love to hear maybe a bit more on the commodity side of things. Um, how are you thinking about that? Sure. Um, commodities in general, I uh, well, let's start with gold. Yeah, gold, my my view right now, I'm bullish gold right now. I think we've uh, we've had another sharp correction in gold. 
Um, it's been frustrating to people, I think, although gold better than silver. Both gold and silver, I think, are poised for big upside here. I'm calling for uh, pretty much coincident with the melt-up, but it might carry a little beyond the melt-up, but I'm calling for gold to go to 3000 this year and uh, silver to go to 60 this year. And silver's down around 20, 22 and change, and gold's obviously... 19 and 1900 and change so so those are big moves uh i think they will then go down during the bust with everything else yeah so it's going to get hit hard um so that you know let's say gold goes to 3000 it could come back to where it is now in the bust better than the stock market which i'm calling for 80 percent down um but still down sharply from there once the printing press gets going um in the manner i'm talking from say 20, you know, late 2024 or sometime in 2025, from the bottom, let's say it's back at 2000, I'm calling for gold to have a huge run the second half of this decade and maybe peak out around 20,000. <laughs> that's, that's crazy talk, but that's- My if, face if, right at 20,000. Because, and, and I'll remind you, if you go back and look at, if somebody said, you know, Amazon in 2000 was whatever it was, or in 2002 or three, and that it was going to be where it is now, or Apple. You know, if you if somebody talked to tech stocks 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, at the prices and said they're going to go up 50 fold or 30 fold, you'd say, no way. How does that happen? So it, it seems crazy, but it's a it's a huge cycle. And it's driven by the fact that we're going to see money um, printed like never before. And you can have an inflation cycle like we haven't had, bigger than the early 80s. And it's going to be prolonged for several years, um, not to mention the dollar is going to be driven lower, et cetera. So there's going to be a lot of reasons for it. Um, and I actually think um, silver will probably get up to four or 500. So, you know, it's in, in the low 20s now. That's a huge run. Um, copper will go through the roof. I don't have a target, but it will go through the roof. Um, I'm, I'm calling for oil to be at four or $500 a barrel by the end of the decade. So, so this is when I say this will be a commodity cycle like none out we've ever seen, it will be. Now the stock market, just quickly, um, the peak I'm calling for this year, you know, the melt up S&P to six to 7,000, I view the high water mark in the market this year will likely stand for decades. So you won't get back to those levels again, uh, certainly in the next decade and probably two. Um, but that doesn't mean there's no investment opportunities because you will have the commodity cycle. So there will be places to be in the post bust period, the 2025 to 2030 period, there'll be some tremendous opportunities. They just won't be in the places where people have found those opportunities in the last 20 years. So, you know, index funds, which have been the place to be, you know, you didn't have to pick stocks. You just put your money in an SP index and you outperform most managers in the last 20 years. Going forward, after the peak, that's not going to be the case. Index funds are going to suffer. So, so it's, it's again, a matter of knowing your cycle, there's new leadership in every cycle. Well, the next cycle, the leadership is going to be in the commodity area, in the industrial area, not in the consumer area, not in index funds. Wow. Oh, David. I, I wanna, oh, man. Wow. Okay, when I hear, <laughs> hear 20,000 gold, um, it doesn't matter. Even if you got in the range there, even if you weren't at 20,000 on the mark. Okay. I always look at gold as like a safe haven asset and maybe i don't know if that's the right way to look at it but that sounds like not the best kind of scenario like great if you own gold but also probably very painful times if you're getting to that level right yes although i will say there's a lot of people who believe that gold goes opposite to the market right the stock market so they think that gold does well in dire times and in bad times and the stock market does well in good times. There have been plenty of cycles where gold moves up with the stock market. And so I would point you to the 2001 to 2011 bull market in gold. Gold went from $250 in 
2001 to $1,900 in, in 2011. That was not a bad time for stock, owning stocks. I mean, you had some periods in there where you had some bad times. But um, so you can have both move together. And coming out of the bust, if the stock market's you know down 80 percent, from that 80 percent drop, you're going to have a, a cyclical bull market, not a secular bull market, but a cyclical bull market in stocks. So let's say let's say the stock market tops out at six thousand, goes down 80 percent. That's twelve hundred on the S and P. The, the S and P can can quadruple, can quintuple. Well, let's say quadruple. Um, and that would get it back to 4,800, it'd still be way short of the 6,000 top, right? So you can have a secular bear, a cyclical bull within a secular bear. So coming out of the bus, there will be opportunities across the board in stocks. But as we move through that cycle, meaning within the year or two, the stock market's gonna top out and start being hit by high inflation, high interest rates, whereas gold's gonna keep running because it benefits from inflation. Yeah. And and at the same time, currency gets hit. You know, the dollar, if we have that kind of environment, the dollar's not going to do well. And there's obviously de-dollarization and other things going on as well. So yeah. You took my next question and made out of my <laughs> mouth as I want to ask you about the dollar. Um, you're right, there has been a lot of talk around de-dollarization. Um, there's been definitely mixed debate on this show about it. What are your views? Um, sounds like you hear I hear from you the dollar, you believe it will go lower in the scenario, but even just your thoughts on the de-dollarization scenario. Sure. Yeah, I'm I'm not in the camp that thinks de-dollarization is an imminent threat. I, I mean, we're obviously seeing it gradually already, you know, with what um the Saudis are doing with China, et cetera. So we're we're beginning to see it and there's uh, at least talk around and you know, Jim Rick Rickards probably has a lot. Uh, better contacts than I do about in terms of, um, you know, China and Russia, the, I call it rumor still out there is that they're, they're going to have a gold back alternative to the dollar very soon. Um, meaning later this year, I, I'm not so sure things happen that quickly. And I'm not certainly not, um, in the camp that believes that the dollar loses reserve status in the next few years. I think it, it's moving in that direction and we will see it lose some of its cloud as we go along gradually. Um, and I think by the end of the decade, for sure, um, you know, we're in trouble. Um, but I think it's premature to think de-dollarization is an imminent thing um, other than, you know, gradually. Um, but that being said, I am, I am a bear on the dollar here. I'm calling for the dollar to go to the DXY to go to 80 this year or in the next 12 months. So um, DXY currently is 92-ish, uh, or I mean 102-ish. Um, I think it can get to the mid 90s next and then down from there to ultimately 80. Um, that's part of my forecast for gold 3000 this year. Um, and then I think the dollar will get bid up like it always does in crisis. When we have a global crisis, a dollar has been the flight to safety trade, right? I think that happens in the global bus. So, so I think you can go from 80 on the dollar back up to 120. I mean, again, these are huge volatile moves that you wouldn't normally expect or or see, but we're at the end of a you know we're coming to the end of a super cycle in this decade, and mm. so. So volatility is through the roof. So I think you go down to 80, back up over 120. And then from there, I think the balance of the decade, the dollar's down and could fall below 50 ultimately by the end of the decade. So so that's, you know, again, lots of moves, kind of kind of counter to what gold is, but that makes sense. Yeah. What about treasuries in this scenario or the thesis? Yeah, you're not going to be disappointed. I, you know, my calls are crazy, so this one is too. But, <laughs> um, but I'm I'm looking for the. Um, I think we're close to this backup in rates. You know, I I called when when the ten year was three thirty. Um, you know, a few months ago, I called for um, it to possibly go back and fill in the gap at three ninety. There was a, a gap down there. So we're we're close. It got up to 385 
week or two ago, and it's 370 now. Um, I'm calling for it ultimately with, you know, a little up so that it could still fill in that gap. But but from here down to 250 in the, this summer. So I think we'll see a two and a half year, 10 year this summer. Um, and ultimately in the bust, if you think about the bust, um, the economy is going to be weak. The central banks are going to be printing, the Fed's going to be printing money like crazy. The government's going to be putting out debt that the Fed will monetize, that the Fed will buy. But ultimately, I view one more lower low in, in treasury. So I think you're going to get to 0% 10 year in the middle of the bus next year. 0% 10 year. We got to a 0.4% 10 year back in 2020, right? So most people think that was the low for ever. I think we have one more lower low, and the potential is there for actually a negative 10-year. I think we're definitely going to see negative rates on the short area, you know, the the um, T-bills and, and two-year notes, et cetera. But I think there's potential maybe because of the magnitude of the printing that we might actually see a negative 10-year briefly, not for very long. The 30-year probably gets down to a half um, from, you know, what is now, you know, 290 or 390 or whereabouts. Um, so, so big run. And then coming out of the bust, I see the 10 year, 10 year and 30 year probably being above 15%, which were their tops back in the early eighties. Uh, if we get 20 to 25% inflation, you know, you're going to see high teens in the, in those and T-bills probably get get up over 20 percent so that's that's when you have the real problems getting as we get to those levels our government's unable to fund its debt i mean i don't i don't see any way they can service their debt with those kind of rates and that's when you know 2030s is probably a collapse of not just our our system but the the system we know around the world i mean it's basically i hate to say it but this has been a giant Ponzi scheme that's been building since the last depression. So for a hundred years or 90 years, and it's accelerated in the last 20. I and mean, we're just doing things at levels that we, you know, how uh, we used to worry about how are our grandkids going to pay the, you know, the debts we're putting on all this debt is going to be left to our grandkids. There's no way anybody's going to be able to pay that. I mean, it's just, we're doing things that you just look at the future and say, you know, it's it's never going to be paid off. It's gonna it's gonna come to a point where, if you can't service your debt, if you can't pay the interest on your debt, and and you know, um, uh, you you're first of all, you're going to be denied access to the capital markets. Our AAA rating is going to be long gone by then, right? People are going to look at our fiscal situation and say, this isn't the safest place to be. And the other the other key to this um, um, is that. Um, you know, as inflation moves up rapidly in the 26, 7, 8 period, the, cent the central bank, uh, the Fed, loses its ability to print money, right? Because if you print money into a, a rapidly rising inflation, that inflation just inflates even further, right? So you, 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 you're pouring gasoline on the fire. So at some point, the Fed is shut out of that game. Just like now, I mean, the Fed doesn't want to print money now, right? Because they're still worried about inflation. Well, this will be much worse than this. You know, inflation will be high and rising, and so they're going to, you know, be in double, double digits, moving to high double digits. They're going to just the, the printing press is shut out of the game. The only thing that allows us to that has allowed us to keep this thing going for so long has been that printing press. Mm -hmm. And it's it's led to these excesses that I think we're just we're getting to the point where that game's over. And uh, and again, the the, the so-called Ponzi scheme collapses, you know, it, it ultimately it collapses unto itself. Yeah. Let me ask you one final question as we wrap this up. Um, is there anything that could alter or change your thesis fundamentally? Anything to kind of avoid uh, 
the the collapse that you see coming? Yeah, I I view it as rather um, inevitable, but I also recognize, you know, the timing. I could be way off. I mean, you know, it it seems to be playing out this way, but it's possible that um, we we don't have the the bust next year. That it's a softer not not a soft landing, but a softer landing than a bust. And that they don't print all this money. They print money, but not to that extreme. And so it levels off the cycles. It makes them less extreme. And you know, you stretch it all out for for maybe even a decade or more beyond. Um, I I'm a big believer that what we've seen is cycle to cycle to cycle. And I've you know I've been through five or six of these since I came into the business. Each one's getting more violent. Each one's getting you, know, you. You're not you're not eliminating the excesses. You're you're coming down a step in the excesses each time you have a you know a downturn, but then you're ramping it up to even higher highs. So we've had these excesses just build higher and higher, and of course, 2008 nine was a severe downturn that led to uh, you know a lot more excesses in the next cycle. 2020 was another very fast but severe downturn that led to even bigger excesses you know we talked about before the size of the fed's balance sheet is just growing exponentially and so it just seems like the next one's going to be another bigger downturn leading to even bigger excesses i think that 300 trillion in debt probably grows to something closer to 475 500 before the end of the decade because of the response during the the bust you know the money is going to be accompanied by a lot of fiscal um, stimulus. So, and, and again, I'm talking about globally, not just here. So, so it, I think it's rather inevitable. But I'm I'm a human being, and I'm certainly there are plenty of people on Twitter to tell you he doesn't know what he's talking about. So, uh, so who knows? <laughs> Yeah. Well, David, I have to say, I've really enjoyed having you on. I would love to have you back on uh, maybe in six months, maybe in a year, whenever. Um, would love to continue this conversation. Again, took a ton of notes. I learned a lot from you. You've given me a lot to think about. I want to give you a moment. If you want to share where folks can you know, follow you on social media, um, learn more about your work and any parting thoughts that you have for the folks watching and listening, please take a moment to do so. Sure. Um, yeah. First, for parting thoughts, let me let me just say because this stuff is overwhelming, particularly for those that have heard it for the first time. I, you know, lots of people follow me and and have heard it enough times. But but when you hear this first time, it's shocking. And and I am one person, and you know, it's my view, and I, I've got a lot of experience, but it doesn't mean I'm right. Um, the the one thing I'll leave your listeners with is. Um, because I have really spent my time with uh, behavioral economics and and um, as a contrarian sentiment for a long time, I can with a lot of confidence say if this scenario plays out, that let's say we're at six to seven thousand on the S and P before the end of this year. Those a lot of your listeners are probably cautious now and nervous, et cetera, and along with a lot of institutional investors. At the top, I can almost predict. That's going to be very hard to be bearish. the The power of the psychology is going to have you wanting to to believe that this thing has a long ways to run and that you know it's clear sailing ahead. That's the time to be cautious. That's the time to guard. When you hear everybody telling you reasons why it's going a lot higher uh, after you've had a big run, that's the time to understand that you know you need to protect yourself against against that psychology. Um, same thing on the downside. When when we if we go through a bust at the bottom, it's going to be very hard to have any optimism. Try to find those green shoots. Try to find those things that can keep you somewhat tempered from from thinking you know all is lost. Because because shortly beyond that is a, a great opportunity. So um, that's kind of from the contrarian perspective. Um, and in terms of where you can find me, I'm on Twitter every day. My handle is at Dave H. Contrarian, not David, but at Dave H. Contrarian. Um, beware, as with anybody with a decent following, there are a lot of uh, fake accounts out there. So they'll change one letter in Contrarian or 
um, something else. Um, just know I have 190,000 plus followers. That's how you can tell it to me. I've had people, I just had one this week email me and say, would you please unsubscribe me? I keep asking you. And he realized he was not talking to me. Somebody had taken money from him mm-hmm. under a false uh, a false premise that I, you know, they use my profile picture. But if you look at the followers, most of those fake accounts have less than a thousand followers. So, so buyer beware, but just be careful with that. Um, but it's at Dave H. Contrarian. And I do have a quarterly letter that I put out by subscription. So there's a cost to it. Um, it's um, all macro, you know, markets and the economy. Um, and you get a lot of what you heard today. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, uh, if they want information on that, just direct message me. I don't, I don't solicit on Twitter, but if they want information, just uh, direct message me on Twitter and I'll, I'll respond to you quickly. Amazing. Well, David Hunter, Chief Macro Strategist at Contrarian Macro Advisors. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time and your ideas. Really, really enjoyed having you on the show. Thanks again, David. Yeah, thanks, Julia. It was was my pleasure.